Well, Tim, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you and, and great to connect with you. Thanks so much. I'm pumped to be here. This is going to be fun. Yeah. So I want to start here. You've worked with some amazing leaders over your relatively short life. You worked at Apple, uh, Tom Shoes, Blake Mykoski, and then building a story brand and which became Business Made Simple. So that's with yeah. Donald Miller. Don's been a guest on this podcast. Those are some really interesting leaders to work with. Steve Jobs, Blake Mykoski, and Donald Miller. Yeah. Tell us what that was like and what you learned from such interesting bosses. Yeah, I just feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with and, and in those cultures and environments that those leaders had created. Tom's, I'll start there. So I worked with Tom's and was traveling all over the country helping put together what were called style your soul parties. So you take this canvas shoe and paint it and it was just so fun. So I got to really be out and about helping just one person at a time help a child in need, right? The whole one for one model is amazing. So here you've got a guy like Blake that is showing me that in leading a business, creating a company, this idea of giving and serving others, that, that was at the foundation of the entire company, right? And what's interesting as you think about even how Tom's got started, now they've given away 95 million pairs of shoes. I mean, they've made a massive splash. But Blake didn't get there trying to get there. Mm. He got there valuing one life at a time and just letting that be enough. And there's this cultural pressure if we're building businesses, leading teams, that we need to have more fans, more customers, more revenue, right? It's almost this, um, just this focus and emphasis on more, more, more. And the model that I learned from Blake is very different from that. It's like one life at a time, let that be enough. So Blake goes to Argentina to, in a lot of ways, just kind of take a break. He, was, he had done a couple different businesses and this is before the days of Tom's. So he's in Argentina, comes across this village of kids, they didn't have shoes and kind of had this idea that what if we actually could get a pair of shoes to these kids, which because they didn't have shoes, they couldn't go to school. Right. And so what a simple solution to a problem. So he had this hope that by the following Christmas, he could come back and sell shoes to people in America and then give a, a pair of shoes away to these kids, 250 pair. So Tom started with this idea of how can we just get shoes for this little village? Well, you know, the rest is history, but the point being, he didn't get there by trying to totally disrupt the business landscape with a new business model of one for one. He didn't get there by trying to create the, the fastest growing shoe company in the world. All those things happened, but he got there by really focusing on one life at a time. And I, I just love that part of Blake's story. What did you do at Apple? Yeah, so I worked on the retail side. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So um, what's cool about that is I was a huge fan of Apple and of the company and the products. And similar to Tom's, I just have always wanted to be a part of things that I was really passionate about. And to me, a job has never been a... I mean, yes, the money is a part of it, but it's more, I've wanted to work in environments where I just can't wait to be a part of the thing that we're doing. And Steve Jobs created that environment, that brand. And so I wanted to do whatever I could to be a part of that. And at the time I'm working at Apple, I heard Steve Jobs say, the joy is in the journey. And I'm like, huh, it's interesting because now here you've got this guy who has achieved success at the highest level actually preaching from that place, the joy is in the journey. What if we can fall in love with the work itself, whether or not people ever know all of the work that has gone into that? And that idea breeds excellence, hmm. right? And so there is a culture of excellence at Apple. And they talked about excellence is the price of admission, it's not this thing that we strive for. It's just expected. And if you ever go into an Apple store, poke your head under the tables and just look at how well the cables are managed. Even that is done with excellence. 
So the same is true inside of a computer. It's beautiful if you ever have an opportunity to open up an Apple and look inside. Don't do it if unless you have yeah, a broken yeah, back yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't try this don't at home, screw kids. anything, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you know this this whole culture around excellence and enjoying the journey and showing up and doing the work, not necessarily for the validation, but just right. the love of the work. And that is something that even though I was several steps away from Steve Jobs, that influence has shaped everything that I did and even building the team and the culture at StoryBrand with Dawn. I pulled that yeah. directly from what I learned from Steve Jobs at Apple. Yeah, so did you work at the retail store or is did it, you work yeah. at Cupertino? Yeah, I was in the retail store. So at the store. retail store. So a couple years in, they, in Chicago and then a year in, in Nashville. So tell me what they train you with. Because I don't think I've ever had anyone on this podcast who's worked at an Apple retail store, or at least mm -hmm. who talked about it. Because that is a very distinct culture. So yeah. what were some things you picked up along the way? Well, it's interesting. They hire, Apple hires for people, the people skills, not the skill set, right? So they figure if we get the right people in the door, we can teach them whatever we need to teach them. And you've likely experienced this in an Apple retail store that they're just relational. They, they, they look people in the eye. They just have really engaging conversations with whoever comes in that's because they're looking for those kinds of people. And then they teach the skill set second, right? So that was a big part of it. But also this massive emphasis around the customer experience. And you and I have both had, we've had miserable customer experiences, I'm sure. I don't oh, yeah. even have I've to had, had ask for share. details, right? <laughs> but it's, it, that is just, when you're able to see things from the Apple perspective, doing everything they could to create an incredible experience. Uh, what that looks like is really it's this posture of serving others, thinking of someone else, putting yourself in their shoes, right? And so what I love about um, how they trained all of us was they had this little tactic that they called reset the clock. If you've ever been to an Apple store, sometimes you have to wait to talk to somebody, right? Yep. And if you've ever been to a restaurant, and they say, okay, what's the wait? It's 45 minutes. You're like, okay, right? Like, but if no one ever checks in with you again, that 45 minutes feels like an hour and a half. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so uh -huh. Apple, because they're thinking of the customer, they're, they're acting with them in mind, do this reset the clock. So if they're doing their jobs well, the host, the person who's often checking you in, will come back to you every five to 10 minutes and just say, hey, I see you, you're still on the list, you're good, you're exactly where you need to be, I got you, right? That 45 okay. minutes doesn't feel like 45 minutes because they're, they're acting with the customer in mind and they do that relentlessly across the entire business. And that's a thing that they trained. It was, it was customer service training first and foremost, for sure. So people first, technology second. That's right, yeah, yeah. So how did you end up working for almost a decade with Donald Miller as his COO at uh, StoryBrand, which eventually became Business Made Simple? How did you make the transition from Tom's to Donald Miller? Yeah, so I, I was doing the Tom's thing for a season, and then my wife and I got married, and we moved to Chicago because she went to grad school at Northwestern. So at the time, I had been kind of out on the road a lot, and for those, that first season of you know, marriage, I just didn't want to have to be gone to make money. That just wasn't going to be a win. Success did not look like me being gone, right? And so I realized, okay, let me find a job that can be local. I applied at two places, Whole Foods and Apple. I, was, I just wanted to work with a great company and ended up getting the job at Apple and had aspirations to actually run an Apple store. Um, but what's interesting is, I just kind of saw my desires changing in that season. Um, and I've always paid attention to that, that those desires changing. And there's actually this, this verse in Psalms, which I think has just been very top of mind for me for a lot of years. Psalm 37, four, delight in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. So I feel like for us to pay attention to the desires, I feel like is God's way of kind of helping us navigate 
you know, the decisions that we should make. So here I was in love with Apple and I just started to see the nights and the weekends and the holidays that was just getting harder and harder. And so I knew, yeah. I mean, this was a really great season. What a career experience. But I knew that actually that was not going to be my long-term thing and started on the side managing a musician and an author um, and loved that work because I got to really bring my ability to manage projects and details and really coming alongside a visionary and supporting them to help them get things done. Loved that part of it. So I really thought I was going to eventually build up kind of this artist management business and then step into um, that fully and have the opportunity to leave Apple. And I actually had a friend who was speaking at one of Don's conferences that we used to do back in the day called Storyline. And one of yeah. the guys I was working with got you know asked to speak at Don's event. And so um, built a relationship with Don through that whole process and come to find out at this specific event, Don was looking for somebody to uh, hire and, and, and really start a, a company with. And so it was a lot of just luck ordained. I have no yeah, idea, yeah. but right. Good so placement. I, I was able to, I, I ended up starting with Don and left Apple and, uh, and then over time ended up having to uh, stop working with the other author and the other musicians because we just started hiring team members and my job was getting more and more, um, I, more was required of me in that season. And so ended up kind of going full in, all in with Don and uh, worked with him up until February of this year and spent almost 10 years coming alongside him as a, a, you know his right hand. And really the, he's such a visionary and had an incredible experience. I, to me, it was a dream job to get to, to work with him for as many years as I did. Well, that was a bit of a rocket ride too, because Don's been fairly um, public with the growth of his company, but yeah. you kind of went from zero, like inception to yeah. what, if, if it's public, please share it. If not, don't, but yeah. what revenue wise is story is a uh, business made. Yeah. Simple I mean, now. the business grew right at the beginning. It was kind of like $250,000 a year and you know, yeah. uh, up to 16. So Don gets to pay his mortgage. And so yeah, do you, yeah, right? 16 and a half million uh, and, and over, over that period of time. So you're right. A lot of growth. And also with that, the revenue, but also I, and this is what I love about working with Don. And it's one of the key tenets of story brand, which is your brand is not the hero. Your customer is the hero. Yeah. Right. So serve them and help them win. I mean, that's just the environment that I've been working in for 10 years kind of right. setting somebody else up to win. And what's beautiful is if you think about your business that way, some really great things can happen. And so I feel like a lot of the success that we had in our business came because we were relentless about solving problems for our customers. And in the end, we ended up you know, having the opportunity to win. So I think about the, the revenue just really was the, the ripple effect of us focusing on adding value, solving problems. And, you know, we had the opportunity to touch a lot of lives in that time, which is really fun. How did you land on that? How did you end up? I mean, you were there from the inception. Yeah. How did you decide it wasn't about growing a business, but it was about coming alongside your customer as the hero? Yeah, I mean, that whole framework really was, you know, created by Dawn. And really, it was my job to free up space to let him go be creative. And then he brings me something beautiful, like a story brain framework. Um, I think a lot of it, though, is, and Don really operates this way, it's this mindset of abundance, not of scarcity. Because I think the right. scarcity mindset has you thinking, oh my gosh, you know, we got to do whatever we can to generate revenue. And what I saw Don doing is making investment after investment with the belief that this will come back around. So we gave so many things away for free that people would and should have likely paid hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for. So the number of free resources that we gave out, whether it's through a podcast, whether it's through a video series, PDFs, I mean, we gave so much content away, really great content that we could have sold but we just knew that if you deliver value, 
that's a really great starting point. And so that I think is, you start to operate that way. You give and give and give. And then to see the revenue respond in the way that you would hope it to, I think it just creates some momentum and gives you courage to do more and more of that. So, so much to the point to where we were selling an online course, the the original story brand online course was $1,500. And Don blew that whole model up and said, what if instead of selling one course, for 1500, we could sell a suite of courses for $275 a year. So completely changed the model and gave people even more value for their money. Just, I feel like that, that really is a byproduct of that abundance mindset and just offering value and that being a pathway to success in your business, but really just helping people win was a starting point. So Tim, let's break that down because that's a similar pivot we've made in my company as well with the Art of Leadership Academy. And, you know, totally transparent, we've been watching what's happening at Business Made Simple. And you're right, 99% of what we do here is free. Nobody's ever paid a dime to listen to this podcast. I've got a website with over a thousand articles with a lot of my really good content on there, or at least the best that I'm able to produce. It's available for free, but we started developing courses. And that really was the, you know, ability that created the ability for me to build a team, to serve leaders better, to do the free stuff. Um, But we went from a pay per course model and our courses were priced around the three, four, five hundred dollar level, not fifteen hundred. And we've done it all now. Three ninety seven a year for the Art of Leadership Academy. That's it. You get everything. What was the thinking behind that? Because that took me a little while to get there, but I want to dissect your approach. And as COO, you would have, you know, led the organization through that along with Don. What's the thinking and how does that even work economically? Yeah. So one of the early examples of this was when we were running our storyline conferences. So this was kind of back pre-story brand and we were helping people, you know, Mm -hmm. learn to live a better story. And so it just felt like the attendance wasn't growing. And so sometimes problems, challenges, allow us to think creatively about how we could approach this a little bit differently. So here you have, I mean, it's a good sized conference, but not ever getting more than like a thousand people at a time, which by a lot of different it's definitions. It's pretty good. Pretty like a lot of people event. would say, sign me up. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> but we decided, yeah. what if we created a pay what you want model? <laughs> and so- We started doing, and I think we set like a minimum of $50, pretty much just to cover materials, right? So people could literally go in and register for a general admission ticket, pay what you want. If you want to put 50 bucks, you can pay 50 bucks. And we created like a tier two and a tier three uh, for people. But what we found was the average was right about what we used to sell tickets for. But we all of a sudden went from a thousand person conference to a 2000 person conference, then to a 2400 person conference, right? So we started seeing this growth. So I think for for us, revenue and all of that has been a byproduct of, but it's not necessarily always been the primary driver for the strategy decisions that we've made. So we, I think, and Don believes this too, it's really about impact. And the ability to influence people's and shape people's lives and businesses. And so it's been great because the revenue has actually continued to grow, but it really was just a byproduct of how can we impact more and more people? That's the focus, right? Like Blake mm-hmm. Mykoski wasn't thinking, oh my gosh, I can make so much money with this idea. He just wanted to help people get shoes, sure. right? And the results followed. And I just feel like we've taken a very similar model and just continued to, I don't know, rewarded is the right word, but like just been rewarded for that. And so when you do it and it works, it makes you want to do it more. And isn't it great that the thing that we were being rewarded for was generosity and adding value and you know having affordable pricing around the products that we were offering? And, you know, that it's just pretty cool when, when those things actually can work together. 
What were some inflection points for the company? Because you went from storyline to story brand to business made simple. But when you think so, you know, one of them was pay as you go, that got you to the next level. What were some other inflection points on this decade long ride over a business made simple? What were some other things that you're looking back going, man, that was, that was such a great decision. You went from even before that Christian memoirist, here you have a guy just writing books for, you know, a faith-based audience to pivot to a business career. That was one of the first ones. So, you know, what that caused us to do was actually give up a lot of revenue and Don stopped speaking at churches, right? I mean, that's a pretty big decision to go all in. That's a big deal. On this idea of, you know, the you know, really impacting the business community. So, there have been some decisions that we've made to to leave money on the table. Even now here you have this conference we were talking about, Storyline, 2,000, you know, 2,400 people at, at the largest event. We killed it because we saw that we were confusing people. They'd say, oh, Don, we love the Storyline framework for my business. It's like, no, no, no. It's the Story Brand framework for your business. It's the Storyline conference for your life plan, right? So we were causing confusion and we have just learned that clarity is as important as anything, right? So if we were confusing, you know, Don says this all the time, if you confuse, you lose. So we made decisions to leave money on the table. The Storyline Conference goes away so that we can be really clear and focus on story brand. So that was another big thing. Christian Memoirist to a conference, killing conference and storyline to really focusing on business leaders. And some of the motivation in that was just following passion. So Don has just got really excited about helping business leaders apply the same techniques and frameworks that we were using to grow our business. So seeing some of the success and the growth and the results that we had, if we actually just taught more people to do some of that in their businesses, that that all of a sudden started just giving Don a bunch of energy. And so in as a creator, it's so important to be excited and connected to the work that you're doing. And I'm not saying he was bored with memoirs, but he says, after you've written your seventh memoir, I think we got it, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I had that conversation with him, Tim, and it was interesting. But here's, I want to I wanna drill down on that because a lot of people would say it's hard to cut. Right. Because I remember when Don did that flip and I actually asked him, you know, how is blue like jazz Don the same Don as uh, business made simple Don? And he goes, sometimes Betsy, his wife, asked me that question, too. And he explained it. We'll link to that in the show notes, which is great. It was a wonderful conversation. But I think a lot of people listening would say, OK, that's great, Tim. But what I would have done is I would have kept speaking at the churches and then gone in on business. Like you cut. It's like, I'm not doing church events anymore. I'm going to focus on story brand and I'm going to equip business and churches that way and not do the blue like jazz yep. speaking tour anymore. So why did you kind of burn the ships? It, it really is just clarity. And I think another phrase that we use a lot is opportunity cost. What's the opportunity cost of investing our team's energy and resources and creating things over here when we could be doing that same thing over here on the story brand side. Like what's the opportunity cost of not burning the ships? Right. So everyone needs to make that decision for themselves. And we did an event in 2014 and we were like, all right, this is going to be the last one. And then we got back and just had the greatest time. And we're like, we got to do one more. And then, so we had a year of really struggling through that decision. Then finally, 2015, we're like, all right, that's, it's the last one. We know that this is the right decision. We're going to make a bet on ourselves and on this idea that there is an opportunity cost if we don't make this decision now. And there's never a good time to do it. Yeah. There's never a good, you know, time to leave tens of or hundreds of thousands of dollars off the table. Like that's just, there's never a good time to lose that revenue, you know, but we just kind of decided, here we go. 
and been really happy with what's happened. It's been a very fun progression and, and journey because it, um, it went really well. How did you learn to be a COO? I didn't really ever learn. You just figure it out one day at a time. Um, what I do know, though, is I found there was this time in my life there's a time in my life when I wanted to be the next John Mayer. Mm. I was going to be famous. <laughs> I was going to stand on stages. People were going to know my name. And spoiler alert, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, so there's a story I'll tell you, and I'll get back to that musician journey. Um, but, you know, in Apollo 11, yeah. a lot of people are familiar with, with Apollo 11. You've got Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, right? But what a lot of people don't know, there's actually a third astronaut on that mission. His name's Michael Collins. So here you've got Michael Collins. The guy ubers Neil and Buzz to the moon, drops them <laughs> off, and then they do the various tasks that they need to do on the moon's surface while he stays back in the command module and orbits the moon something like 26 times until the guys are ready to be picked up and brought back to Earth. And what would make this a miserable story is if Michael gets back, sits down with the press, and would say something like, well, it sure would have been nice to actually walk on the moon. Right, you know, right. acted like a victim, tried to take the spotlight away from the mission as a whole, but that's not at all what happened. He gets back, sits down with the press, and talks about how content he was to have had one of those three seats. Mm. And for so many of us, we're told that to be successful, we have to step into the spotlight, climb the ladder, be the boss. But as I actually hear those messages, and then I think back to my own career journey, I actually found that the meaning and fulfillment that I was looking for in my life and career came when I stopped trying to be John Mayer mm. and started being the right-hand man to Don. Wow. So I actually have learned to be content in the seat that I had. So sometimes success looks like just playing our role. And if I were to try to be Don, the whole thing falls apart. What made it successful was I was just doing my part. I, you know, Don says, Tim, I hired you because of my liabilities. What do you mean by that? That's what a great team, his skill sets, his skill set and my skill set really uh, complemented one another. You know, he had big vision, but I had this operations, attention to detail, you know, love for, you know, assembling a team and, you know, collaborating with them every day. He loved to create and kind of go off by himself and do his thing while I got to run the business. So I hired you because of my liabilities. The things that he didn't feel like he did well, he found in, in me. My ability to step in and do that part is what made the thing work. But we needed the vision. We needed him in his sweet spot too, right? So I think the point is there's so many people that talk about success as this climb the ladder, rise to the top. But I actually think for a lot of people, what if, you being the best in your role is exactly what the organization needs. And just to lean into that, because it's almost like we're measuring our success and our contentment against this definition that maybe just doesn't even feel true for us. So when I'd hear that, it just didn't feel true. My success, the, the, the growth that I found in my personal career actually happened when I went in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So how did I learn how to be a COO? It just kind of happened over time and really just continuing to lean into what it is that I brought to the table and, you know, finding contentment there. I think you and Don had a great relationship from what I understand of it, but there's often tension between a visionary, which Don would be or I would be, and an operator, as yeah. Les McEwen uses those yeah, categories, yeah. Right, Somebody who comes in and does the tactical, does the execution. So in the church world, that senior pastor, executive pastor often. Um, in the business world, it's uh, CEO, COO. What were some of the tension points, if any, that you and Don had, and how did you overcome them? 
Yeah. Um, the guy loves to go fast. Yes, he does. He's moving. He is moving. <laughs> and I think so often I would drive him crazy when I'm like, let's just think about this. For, can we just slow on down? And he's like, let's go ship it. Here we go. And so I think we had a really good balance between his drive and my like perfection. And there are some moments when me as an operator, I have to you know, say, Tim, are you going to, is this a hill to die on? Because there's some days Don just needs a yes man. He just needs somebody to be like, cool, let's figure it out. Yeah. Here we go. He needs that ah. sometimes. But there's also times that he needed to lean into my, you know, desire to slow things down. And so I don't think that you ever really perfect that. You just learn to live in the tension between those things, right? So we don't solve it. You just, you acknowledge what is going on, what's at play, and then just allow those things to kind of work in each and every moment. Because there's not a one size fits all to every decision. Fast is not always best. Slow is not always best. But for that particular thing, you have to really land on, you know, what feels right. Yeah, that's a really delicate interplay and it doesn't always work well. How did Don, to the extent that you can speak for him, how did he not try to turn you into that rubber stamp he wanted? And how did you learn to not turn him into you? Like, in other words, just always be the, no, slow down. No, wait, 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 yeah. wait a minute. No, you haven't thought this through because... That is a very real tension on so many teams. So how did you learn to respect and hear each other? Yeah, I think if I were to ever try to... I, I, he, is, he is just always going to be the visionary, dreaming up new ideas, just constantly throwing stuff into the pot. And if I try to shut that down, I actually shut down the greatest part of him. Right? Yeah. So I think part of it is just this awareness of this is his magic. This is it. So if I try to squash that, I am not actually setting our team up for success. But I also think that what happened was he saw me slow things down and actually started to see, oh, here's Tim's motivation in doing this. And I had to also earn trust by being right on a few of those, right? <laughs> yeah. You're not going to get point. the that longer leash if you're not right, right? That's a really So, so much point. of it was yeah. he saw me do that and then we still won and he started to realize this can be great. There are moments when I do need to let him do his thing, right? So here's a, here's a really great example. Uh, and, and, you know, of what I'm talking about, the so often I was the one directing him on set. I'm listening for the details as he's presenting a course or, or whatever. And so early on, if I'd stop him, maybe there'd be a little frustration, right? Yeah. But then he sees the end product and he's so thankful that I stopped him because he saw this is better, right? And so... He trained himself and has said this, you know, publicly that that ability, it's almost his mindset shifted from we are on the same team here. This isn't Tim versus Don. This is we are trying to do whatever we can to create the best possible product. And I think for all of us, a lot of this can just be an ego thing. And what I love about Don is there is no void. If there is a void in leadership, he is going to lead and point the direct, like point us in a particular direction, right? Um, but if somebody brought a counterpoint to his idea or his point, he is always willing to listen. But you better bring a better version, hmm. right? If you're not making it better, you're right, you're right. not going to win, and it's not winning that is really the most important thing. But it, it, he was always willing to have some of that humility to allow other people's ideas to be pushed forward if they presented it in a way that really made sense. So I really did love that about him. If I brought an idea and I'm like, I think this is better to do it this other way, he's like, actually, you're right. You know, so I, I appreciated that so much. 
So you've got a new book. It's called The Secret Society of Success. Stop chasing the spotlight and learn to enjoy your work and life again. Tim, um, let's break down the spotlight mindset. What is it and what's wrong with it? So I define the spotlight mindset as this unhealthy desire for attention and recognition. And there's so much about the spotlight mindset that's just human. We want to be seen. We want to feel like we matter. Yeah. And so, so much of that, the way that we feel like we that can matter is by people seeing us and recognizing us and you know, knowing the contribution that we had made. Um, but, you know, if the spotlight mindset isn't kept in check, it can lead us down some pretty destructive paths. So there's a few symptoms that I'd love to kind of share with yeah, you about yeah, what the spotlight mindset is, because I feel like it will help us to, you know, identify this in our own lives. And I heard a guy named Tom House say, problem identification is half of the solution, right? right. It's like, we got to know what we're operating from before we can then know how important it is to, you know, really solve it. So here's a few. Striving is actually a symptom of the spotlight mindset. Do you struggle to find contentment in your life? Does it lead you on this restless pursuit for more? Mm. That The spotlight mindset tells us there is no amount of revenue that will ever satisfy us. It's True. more, more, more. That is always the goal, Right. So maybe it's that, that that's a, a problematic for us. Comparison. Do you wish you were someone else or wonder how your success stacks up against others? Are you willing to knock others down to win or get ahead? Are you jealous in a way that gets in your way? So, so many of us measure our success against others, right? Like, are you only happy if your company is more, quote, successful than your neighbors, right? It's like, that comparison, you know, C.S. Lewis says, comparison is the thief of joy, and he's right, <laughs> you know? So here's another one, damaged relationships. And, you know, somebody that I've actually been pretty inspired by, I'm sure you know, Michael Hyatt. So Michael Hyatt, uh, in, in one of his recent books, talks about a particular failure story in his own life from his past. And so he was given the opportunity to run a division at a book publishing company. And at the time, the division he was given the opportunity to run was ranked 14th out of 14 on all significant metrics, team morale, revenue, all that. So he tells the then CEO, give me three years, I'm gonna turn this thing around. So in fact, in only 18 months, he turned the thing around. That division was now at the top. Revenue, team morale, it couldn't be higher. Michael gets a bonus check that he says was larger than his annual salary and he couldn't wait to get home, tell his wife about it. You know, she was his biggest fan. He knew she would be thrilled. So he gets home excited, sits down and, and talked to her. And she, she says, we need to talk. And, and with tears in her eyes, she says, your five daughters need you now more than ever before. And in fact, I feel like a single parent. So here Michael was having all the success that he could imagine on the career side, but relationships with the people that mattered most to him was suffering. So fortunately, Michael's able to identify this. And now, you know, one of his more recent books is called Win at Work and Succeed at Life, right? It's, yeah. it's this idea of the devil win, he calls it. So he now views success very differently. It's winning in both of these things that is success. But the spotlight mindset will trip us up and it will cause us to believe that success in business perhaps is maybe the only thing that matters, but those relationships can really get to us. So, you know, those are just a few of the symptoms, but really it really comes down to, you know, that spotlight mindset, that unhealthy desire uh, of, of attention and for debt, sorry, the unhealthy desire for attention and recognition, it really can trip us up. And it's a thing we need to be aware of because something as simple as our definition of success really shapes our behaviors and the way that we view situations and, and, and really it, it influences our actions. So we need to be aware of it so that we can actually start to choose another path. Right. What is your definition of success? So I now define success as learning to live in the way of the secret society. And, you know, there's this group of people that really have been influential for me. It's stories that I've just accumulated over time that are just showing me a different way um, that, that success can look. And at the foundation, the common denominator for people in the secret society is 
really this posture of service, of helping others win. And it doesn't matter if you're the CEO or in a supporting role. The secret society has little to do with your position or visibility, and it has far more to do with how you show up, how you view your career and your life, and really the, the decisions that you make. And so, you know, one of my favorite stories is Tim Cook. So Tim Cook's the CEO of Apple, but before that, he was COO under Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs passes away. Um, the person who had been groomed to take over is, is Tim Cook. So we're at the release of the Apple Watch, which was a pretty big deal for not only Tim, but also for Apple, because this was the first new product that had been released since Steve had passed. So after the big announcement, Tim's being interviewed on national television, David Muir asked him, is this the moment for you, the moment of your career at Apple? And just think how you would respond if you're Tim in that moment. Yeah, that's Here quite a you've question. been operating for decades under the radar. People have no idea the contribution that you'd made. So you'd probably want to use it as an opportunity to let people know all that you've done to get to this place, right? Yeah. The, the spotlight mindset tempts us to just take all the credit in that moment. But what's beautiful is how Tim actually responded. Is this the moment for you, the moment of your career at Apple? He says, well, it's a moment for Apple. I don't really think about myself that much. And, and there's a, a plaque that sat on Ronald Reagan's desk when he was president. And it says, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. So there is a way that I am choosing to live. How I define success is now more in line with the Tim Cooks of the world. The secret society is actually preaching, serve others, you know, help someone else win, shine a spotlight on your team. You know, it's more about that than it is me trying to you know, get the spotlight. Yeah, and, and I think you're comfortable sharing this, but before we started recording, you talked about uh, making that hard decision to leave business made simple. Can you talk about the conversation with you and Don and what he yeah. decided to do? Yeah. So I had never released a book. This is my first book. The closer I got to the release, the more I realized the time it takes to do it well, <laughs> right? But I had a yeah, pretty big no easy. job, uh, you know, with Don and leading a, a team, and and I in no way wanted to let the work that I was doing with this book have and cause my work as you know a leader on that team to suffer. And so I felt like I was, you know, up against what I'd consider a pretty impossible decision, you know. But what I decided to do was I I, I left the dream job to go chase another dream. And when we told the staff uh, about my transition, you know, we set out like a 90 day timeline because I really wanted to make sure that everybody was set up for success before I, I pivoted out. And, you know, Don told the team, you know, hey, you've, you've made my dreams come true. I want us to do everything that we can to make your dream come true. And so, you know, it's one thing to say that, but it's another thing to, to act on that, right? And what's been remarkable, and I've not really told many people this, but Don actually was paying me for six months after I transitioned out of the company. That's so, so generous. I, I leave. And you left voluntarily. I left, and he's paying me for six months because he's really walking the talk. I mean, he's like, I, I, you've made my dreams come true. I want to do whatever I can to make your dream come true. And so it's just been so beautiful for me to step into this new career as a, a writer. I just launched a podcast uh, this past week called Build a Winning Team. And I'm just, all of this work that I'm doing, there's no way I could be doing all of that while also you know, executing my job at you know, Business Made Simple and StoryBrand to the level that I would be comfortable with. And so to then feel the comfortability to just step into it without that urgency of I have to make money on day one. I mean, what a gift. So I just really credit Don a lot for um, responding in that way. And a lot of people who 
be in that position, it'd be really easy for there to be some resentment and almost him making me feel guilty about leaving. And I'm sure he could have said some things that it would have been pretty, you know, hard. Um, but he responded not at all with any of that guilt or that you're leaving me and abandoning us. Like none, none of that. Right. None of but that. you can imagine yeah. how leaders could say something like that to somebody who had been with them from the very beginning. He actually went the opposite direction and he's just really been championing me. And um, so it's been really fun to to step into some of this. And I've, I've wow. actually a guest on the story brand pod or the business made simple podcast He's going to be a guest on my podcast. So this idea of helping others win, we talked about this earlier in the conversation, but you have, you know, the whole story brain frameworks around be the guy, not the hero, help others win. Well, here you've got a guy that's been living that out. And now it's no surprise that that's exactly how he's responding to me and, and really setting me up to win. It's really interesting, Tim, because, you know, it's very easy to imagine all of us listening to your story in your shoes and say, well, that would be the best boss ever. Because <laughs> what, what you shared earlier is like, yeah, he even said, maybe there's something we're not talking about here. Is it time for you to go out on your own? Like he even kind of gave you the idea and the blessing because yeah. you want to try to figure out how to make it all work, yeah. which is extremely generous. And then to pay you, well, of course, if you're in your shoes, you're going to be like, Man, like Don's on the my favorites list on my phone. Like yeah. he's getting a Christmas card every year. Like he's one of my favorite people. But it's also very easy for us as the boss to understand why you might not do that. Why you might say, well, you're leaving, you're out on your own, or be resentful, yeah. and he chose not to do it. So it's a it's a beautiful case study in the uh, tension, the paradox of leadership. But I want to I want to tie it into this, and this is my final question. This seems to go back to like abundance mentality, yeah. which seems to be at the heart of the secret society of success. Yeah. Talk about for someone who doesn't have an abundance mindset, somebody who falls into the spotlight trap. Mm -hmm. How do you can you generate like can you can you nurture an abundance mindset? Or do you think once you're scarce, you're always scarce? Like how how would you coach someone toward a more abundant, open? approach. So much of survival for us requires us to almost show up and, you know, ask kind of what's in it for me. That's natural. But I don't think that that's the healthiest version of us. And I actually heard Andy Stanley speak at an event in Atlanta. And he talked about, you know, finding our purpose and, you know, living lives and careers of meaning and he said, these kinds of questions that, you know, what's in it for me? Why am I here? These, these are very normal questions yeah. to ask, but they're the wrong questions. He says, the question we need to ask is, who am I here for? And what I love about that question is it requires us to show up, bring our best, to do our part with excellence. But the whole headspace that we're operating from is that of helping somebody else win, of serving others. And I love this so much that I went back to my office and created a uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And up at the top, I wrote, who am I here for? And beneath it, I put the pictures and the names of every single person on my team. Because like you, there's days when you have a never ending task list. There's meetings on your calendar like crazy. It's on those days when you just want to beeline it to your desk and just get your stuff done. Head right? down, get it done. And there's a time yep. for that. But I needed that visual because I needed a reminder on those days to actually ask myself, Tim, who are we here for today? Because that requires, that just little 30 seconds of reflection causes us to have our antenna up for our team members to have our antenna up and to almost like infuse more meaning into the work that you're doing, not only with your team, but also for your customers. Because what if the work that you're doing, if it's to serve your customers, what a beautiful thing. Who am I here for, right? Is, is this growth in your business to help you make more money? 
I mean, money's a really important thing in running a business, but I just don't think that's it. If I ask you to fill in the blank, success is no one that I'm inspired by has ever said, make a lot of money. No. Right? No. And, and, uh, it's actually often the people who give a lot of money, yes. or people who make their life about someone else. And, mm-hmm. and so I think that's it. And if there's a North star for me, as I've been working on this book and really, if there's a, a kind of a visual that I want to have, as I step into this next season of my life, it's this quote from Albert Schweitzer. He says, I don't know what your destiny will be. Some of you will perhaps occupy remarkable positions. Perhaps some of you will become famous by your pens or as artists, but I know one thing. The only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. That's great. Well, Tim, the book is called The Secret Society of Success. Where can people find you online these days? Like, where are you hanging out? If you go to secretsocietyfree.com, I actually give people a couple, you know, free chapters if they want to get a little snippet of the book. And there is kind of where also you can find all the other places about social links and, and those things. But really, if there is something that I want people to do is I want to get out of the way as fast as possible, because this idea of redefining success is the conversation I'm really wanting to start and, and push forward. So it makes all the difference in how we show up in our lives. And so I hope that uh, more and more people will learn to live in the way of the secret society. That would be a massive win for me. So however I can uh, serve people to to make that happen, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Tim, thanks for being with us today. And thanks for everything you're doing for leaders. Oh man, thanks so much for having me. So, so fun. Thank you for watching the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I hope it's helped you thrive in life and leadership. And if you haven't yet checked out the Art of Leadership Academy, inside you'll find everything you need to lead, grow, and run a church. And now, a word from our sponsor, Belay. If you've ever struggled with bookkeeping, watch this video because not only is it going to increase your peace of mind, but you're going to wonder why you waited so long. It's tax season. I still need all of your vendors' W-9 forms from last year. Here. (laughs) That's nice, sweetheart, but I'm not thirsty. Whoa, whoa. A belay bookkeeper? Really? Is that where we are now? I took care of the forms for Dan this morning. They are already in your inbox. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, let's let them enjoy their day. Never miss a moment. Modern staffing from Belay. Great, please. You know there's not even any real tea in there? Oh, well, she's a young girl. Let her have fun. Have fun today, sweetie. Get out. Go. You are being ridiculous.